Hey everybody, we are Francis, Martin, and Robert, and this is Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Get ready, we're about to live in your head rent-free. Welcome back to Snakes and Otters. This is episode 58, one of our history episodes. I am Martin. I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Sitting in the captain's chair this time, this is our uh, the third of our four-part series on the Civil War. Uh, we're uh, kind of doing the four major battles of 1863, kind of an analysis of uh, how they went, uh, what was good about them, what was bad about them, and uh, why we should care about them. Uh, we, this is the big dog, one of the big dogs. They're all big dogs, actually. Uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, my gosh, how much ink has been spilled over the Battle of Gettysburg since it happened hundreds of years ago is enormous. We're going to tap into that a little bit. Uh, we're going to kind of try to narrow this down. It's, it's really one of the great watershed moments in American history. That's the reason we want to focus on it. But before we get into that, just go and kind of lay the groundwork, uh, a little bit of perspective, context here for why it's. Uh, at, at, when we're recording this in uh, June of uh, 2020, we're right in the middle of a national debate uh, with regards to Confederate history in general. Uh, which, of course, there is no such thing. It's all United States history, as Lincoln would say. And currently, we're in the point where many Confederate statues are actually being torn down. And us guys at Snakes and Otters, we're all in favor of this because we believe that there is no place in a civic context, which is where all these are coming from. They're actually in cities uh, as a monument to somebody that supposedly did something great. And when, in fact, as Martin would often say, they were simply vile racists. So, so many of these things are coming down now. And we just kind of wanted to lay out one of the reasons that we're fascinated by Civil War is, A, the entire Confederate mindset is a bit alien to us. Uh, we're Union guys from the very beginning. Ulysses S. Grant and Sherman are two of our greatest, greatest heroes because they saved the Union. Lincoln is too. Uh, and, but we still don't quite understand the whole lost cause understanding or why this was such a great thing in the minds of our southern brothers and sisters. And this is kind of, we were talking about this in the show prep, in many respects the Civil War did not completely end. Uh, it went underground in many ways and for 150 years after that, things have not been great, but we've had shining moments. And the Civil Rights Act of 1964 certainly was a big one. And what we're going through now is also a big one. And we're working towards racial equality in, a, in an unprecedented place. I've said many times that we Generation Xers are one of those generations where racism is not tolerated like it was with our great grandparents and parents' generations. And this is a societal change that's important. Our discussion of Gettysburg is an attempt from a military perspective to understand why was there even a lost cause idea? Why was this something somebody was willing to die for? Because uh, it makes no sense to us today, but by that same point, we don't want to forget it. We want to make sure that you know his, those who do not understand history are doomed to repeat it. Racism and all the evils that went with it need to be stamped out completely. But in order to do that, we have to understand what they were and why they were what they were. Guys, you want to uh, add on yeah. to this? Yeah, Francis. Let me let me give you one caveat though. I am all for competent authority in a spirit of debate looking to remove statues. I am against mob destruction of statues. Oh, yeah, that is correct. That is a perfect caveat because we believe that this is something we as a society should do in a united and, and true manner. Lawful because, way. Because otherwise, I, yeah. it, otherwise it's almost meaningless because yeah. then, it's just, then it's just tyranny. It's just, uh, yeah, the tyranny, it's just the tyranny of the mob the is the mob. same as tyranny any other, way, other way. Yes. I think we've reached the point of reason and enlightenment, there's that word again, yeah. that we as a society can stand together, as, as, as many state legislatures have been doing on this. They stand together almost unanimously saying, yeah, these need to go. And they have yeah. been. Yeah. Uh, and it's been done in the, in the right way. That's what we're looking for. And that's fortunately what seems to be happening most of the time. Most uh, of the time. Not yeah. every time. That's correct. There are a few that... Uh, but yes, I, I, I was fully in support of the removal of Jefferson Davis from the uh, Kentucky Capitol. Again, yeah. I, I've never understood veneration of Jefferson Davis. Uh, he escaped being hung by just a, a, a whisker, I guess. Um, 
Well, that was in many respects that was Grant too, because he believed as Lincoln did that he wanted reconciliation first. Yes. and they were and they were right in a strategic vision because you've got generations of hatred that this will flare up again unless yeah. you do that. And in many yeah. respects, it was hard enough to get rid of the damn race, the vile racism. Uh, anyway. If I may butt in for a moment, please. Uh, yes, please. <clears throat> so, uh, what I'd like to point out about all this is, um, you know, our fascination obviously is the historical. Uh, and it's easy for those of us who um, uh, look at it strictly at the historical to uh, be misunderstood. And that's why we're, we're talking about this yes. here. Because uh, it's, it's one thing to, uh, to point out that, say, for instance, when we get around to our World War II series next year, uh, to talk about somebody like Rommel as having been an incredibly skilled general. Uh, that's an entirely different thing from saying that we should round up all the Jews and kill them. Uh, and so, you know, you might hear some, you know, similar things to that. We talk about how skilled a general Stonewall Jackson was. That doesn't mean that we think blacks should be enslaved. Uh, and as far as the statues go, um, you know, the, I've said this before in, in our own private conversations, and we've all said it in one way or another. We've, we're the only country that, that puts up monuments to the loser, losing side in a civil war. And yeah. to put it in perspective, if we had lost the Revolutionary War, what the English would have then called the American Rebellion or the Colonial Rebellion or something like that, because it's only a rebellion when you lose. When you win, it's a revolution. <laughs> yeah, when you win, it's a revolution. Well put, sir. So it would be the same as if in England they decided to put up or to allow to be put up in, in what were the colonies – uh, statues to Washington and Jefferson and Franklin and Benedict yeah. Arnold and you know because presuming presuming he did not uh, have to betray but uh, you know all of these figures that would have been traitors mm -hmm. you know that would be unthinkable for them and it would be unthinkable for us to, to to do the same thing we don't put up statues to uh, to to you know to people who rebel against lawful authority it's just but for some reason. We've done it here. And I just have always thought this to be such an odd thing. You know, statues and uh, displays on a historical battlefield are one thing. Yeah. Uh, statues and monuments, because those are different. Monuments are, this is a great man. Uh, in the middle of cities, uh, especially in a state like Kentucky that never left the Union, uh, to, you know, that are about Confederates, you know, statues that are about Confederates, it's just such a, an odd thing, especially when you consider most of these were done in the early 1900s. You know, that's when the lost cause really took yeah, off. That's right. Yeah, that was the, that's the context yeah. behind most of yeah. these. Reconciliation and trying to stitch the country back together and, and a little bit of forgiveness is one thing, but 50 years later, uh, a state that doesn't leave the Union then celebrating Confederate figures, it, it, you're right, Robert. It's it's mind-boggling, and I think we've mentioned it before in these podcasts. What must a black citizen of this town or the state feel like walking around or driving around this town uh, or the state and seeing that stuff? Um, Absolutely, it, it has to hurt so incredibly. Um, so it's yeah. yeah, it's high and time to heal that. Right, and it's a, there's a little shame for those of us that didn't make this as important an issue as it always should have yeah. been. But, yeah. you know, oh. repentance is what it is. We come, to, we come to understanding when we do. And I do think you're right, uh, uh, both Robert and Martin, the reason that all these things were allowed to crop up uh, is because of that uh, spirit of reconciliation that both Lincoln and Grant fostered, uh, that they wanted to do that. That became the, uh, that became the mantra after this. And therefore, extreme tolerance was shown because you're exactly right. This shouldn't have happened. Well, I, I would understand but, it if most of the, these monuments that are being come, coming down now had happened after Reconstruction was over. Right. But, you know, it's not. It's, it's at least 50 years later. And, and it's yeah, by a generation true. that were either not born or were children of those who fought uh, in, yep. in the Civil War. So that's, to me, what really stands out when you think about the origins and the timeline. You have to have had a different purpose in putting them up and say, uh, you know, if you want to go states' rights, for instance. Yeah, that's part of it, but the states' right was, was held up so that they could enforce slavery. 
Yeah. You, know, yeah. you can't disassociate the one thing from the other. Correct. Yeah. And yeah. those that have no experience of what the Confederacy was, how it was put together, and how it was fought for and against, putting up these monuments, yeah. uh, it, it, to me it's no different in many ways than uh, modern-day neo-Nazis uh, in the sense that they have no experience of what it meant to live in Nazi Germany, and yet for whatever reason they idealize it. And I know a lot of people in the South will, will hate me for saying that, but you know, philosophically it's the same thing. Now, whether you want to say that, that flying the Confederate flag is better or worse than, than flying a Nazi flag, that, that's an entirely different discussion. But um, you know, philosophically, it's the same thing. Yeah, you're exactly right. And uh, I think a lot of that is changing, too. I think most – and that's kind of what we're experiencing now in this year of 2020 – that no longer is that tolerated. Uh, those in power recognize, yeah, this is wrong, it's always been wrong, and we actually have the will to do something about it. A lot of times I think apathy has been our greatest foe in this because it's like, you know, if I'm not affected by it, why should I worry about it? Uh, well, and, national national consciousness may have changed. Most people, when they went by that Confederate statue uh, over by U of L, uh, probably didn't even realize that was a Confederate statue unless you were on campus and you were walking by it as opposed to driving by it. That's right. You had to see it was a monument to Confederate dead. And that's been gone for quite a few years now. Right, uh, right. Uh, the, the, the one about uh, uh, Castleman, which was has drawn so much ire in recent years, is finally coming down. Uh, it may even be down. I'm not exactly sure. It's uh, uh, there are, you know, we, we have to, there's, there's a movement currently, and I'm going a little bit down a rabbit hole, but you know we do that, uh, to take down all statues of people I'm not sure that's where we want to go with this, yeah. but I do understand the fact that if everybody is flawed, and they all and all people always are, here's our universal truth again. How can we put up a statue to accept very very few? Well, and that's that's one of the things that I, I, has come to me many times over all of this. If you start saying, "Well, we can't have this person's statue up because we don't like what they thought." 200 years ago or 150 years ago or even 75 years ago or whatever, you run the very real danger of history becoming 100% malleable because it, what you're doing is you're basically saying if we don't like what happened before, we're going to change it, we're going to get rid of it. That's, that's entirely Big Brother. Yeah. yeah, and that's dangerous from our perspective as historians because, going back to the premise, if you, for, if you do not understand history, you will repeat it. Right, uh, and, and I'm not saying that, that means you have to leave up Confederate statues because otherwise you'll forget that's, that's an entirely different thing. Absolutely. I'm talking about the philosophical push to, to do this because if you think about it, in 50 years, uh, given the, the way things have gone with, um, for instance, gay marriage, uh, it is very likely that anybody who has a statue up or who was an important figure today or 25 years ago that didn't believe in it could have people come along and do the very same thing, people that are culturally lauded today. And it's the kind of thing where it just – when you start thinking about the indiscriminate tearing down of things and censuring of the past, it's a very dangerous thing. It may feel good now, and in the context of now, it may even be right, some of what's being done, or even most of it. But it's a very dangerous thing, because once that power is given, it's very difficult to take it back. Yeah, and that's why it's so important that this has to be something that's done through, you know, the lawful authority and, uh, and, and debated, um, because otherwise it becomes very Orwellian. You know, it always reminds me of... He who controls the past controls the future, and he who controls the present controls the past. Man, you should really use that for our code of honor the next time. <laughs> well, yeah. That's a, well, actually, we're going know. to do a George Orwell, uh, a, a Heroes episode, uh, just a few episodes from now. Uh, and I'm sure that's going to come up. I know, yeah. Martin, you're yeah. going to be talking about that. Yeah, I'm the captain, and, and uh, Orwell profoundly affects my thinking but anyway I, I think we've 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 done our uh our disclaimer our disclaimer here <laughs> let's we have this that what expired if. cavalry equine enough yes that's right because really the point of this episode is a what if and that what if is what if stonewall jackson was present at gettysburg and isn't killed uh at chancellorsville 
So yeah, this was this was the lost cause myth. I mean, if you boiled it down, yes. uh, and the lost cause. Just to give you a little background on what that is, that's the idea that we've been dancing around a little bit here. After the war, the South, many in the South. Uh, could not accept the defeat that they were handed militarily, so they went underground and decided to create a whole mythos around it. The Ku Klux Klan came out of that, and so did the Lost Cause myth. And, the, and one of the fruits of the Lost Cause myth, which was longer than the generation that fought, it goes into the next two generations after that, and that's kind of where these statues came from, is we were the righteous ones, but we just, something happened, that caused us to lose, whereas we shouldn't have. Yes. And Stonewall yeah. Jackson's death at Chancellorsville is one of those linchpin moments. There are many, and with regards to Gettysburg, there actually there's actually one too because oh they gosh. thought, yeah, how many how many of those? Because that was. Yeah. I'm going to liken well, the Longstreet the himself cause. was vilified. I want to liken the whole lost cause uh, mythos that you've laid out there. Uh, I, I, I use the Nazis as an, uh, an example. Uh, before, and I, I don't want to do this again, but this is just such a great parallel. This whole, we were the righteous ones, there's no way we should have lost, something had to, we had to have been betrayed, uh, which is where the vilification of Longstreet comes in. Um, when you look at the German reaction to World War I, they were never invaded, no foreign soldiers set foot on German soil, and Hitler took that whole myth of the, 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 the uh, superiority of the German soldier and turned that into the Jews stabbed us in the back. And that's right. why we lost World War I. Yeah. That's the and same, that's and what the same dance, power. different tune. That's yeah. all it is. Yeah. It's, it's exactly. a very parallel myth, exactly, Robert. A very parallel myth of we were betrayed, um, we were righteous. It couldn't have been Robert E. Lee's fault. A lot of the lost causes to protect Lee it yeah. is, especially when he dies just a few years after the end yeah, of the war. Yeah, he dies just five years after the end of the war, so there has to be a lot of protecting Lee and finding another scapegoat, uh, finding finding who who betrayed us in the War of Northern Aggression. Even though the South fired first, it was the War of Northern Aggression. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, and those wounds took a very long time to heal. And they didn't heal well in many ways because we still have some of their scars around us today. Well, you know, uh, not to go on down too much rabbit hole on the, on the legacy, but I think you almost have to uh, yeah. to understand some of this stuff. You know, the Confederate flag, uh, it, it's probably pretty much dead as a socially acceptable symbol almost anywhere, even in the South. Uh, if not now, then very shortly. When NASCAR says you can't fly it anymore, it's pretty much a dead symbol. Yeah. And... You know, people today say, well, that's more about state rights and that's about my southern heritage and blah, blah, blah. No, sorry. The after effect of the Civil War, it's, I think, is this inferiority complex that, the, that was given to the South. And this desire to fly that flag that is so identified with the South, you know, capital T, capital S, uh, it is, it, to me, it's just, it's a fascinating thing. You know, maybe it's because the, with the lack of industrialization in the South uh, and with it the uh, probably the better, better educated uh, uh, states in the North overall, uh, the, the extreme poverty that the South has endured uh, since the Civil War, uh, all of these things have contributed to a chip on the shoulder of the South. And I think the Confederate flag is just a convenient symbol more so than it is in all cases, certainly in many cases it is, but I think it's more of a convenient symbol of a time when the South wasn't uh, the poor cousin of the North. You're well said. You're exactly right. Uh, and it, it, people don't like to lose, and if, uh, you know, the, the cause was not stamped out because people still lived, because it was geo geographically based in some yeah. aspects, you, you couldn't avoid it. And that's just what they that's just what they did. And uh you're right, it's it's extremely fascinating. Uh, in a sad way, because yes. uh because the whole point of uh reconstruction and all that's come after that is to try to bring us back into one nation, a free nation. Uh and it's not been an easy struggle. Uh and that maybe that's why race relations are so bad here versus maybe other places in the world. Not to say that we don't have problems elsewhere on this, but uh ours is unique. And 
and that tied up in that is that whole lost cause myth that kept a lot of these stories alive afterwards. And we want to kind of explode a little bit of that, but first we kind of got to talk about them. And um, but before we talk about what if Stonewall Jackson, the, the the lost cause myth of if Stonewall Jackson were there. We got to set the darn thing up because if you don't have context, that will mean absolutely nothing. And Martin has volunteered for some strange reason to do that. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I love telling the story. So, yeah, uh, yeah. For those of you who's not familiar with the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, the idea here is for Lee to invade the North for a couple of purposes. Uh, Virginia has been ravaged by the war, fought over. Uh, incessantly. So he's trying to give Virginia a break, give Virginia a chance to recover a bit and and have a summer where Virginia is not the center of battle. Uh, and he also hopes that if he can find military success in Pennsylvania uh, threatening Harrisburg or Philadelphia, that it will strengthen the peace party in the north and put pressure on Lincoln to come to a negotiated settlement. So he moves north. Um, Lincoln orders Hooker after the Battle of Chancellorsville to give chase. Um, so on the other side of the Blue Ridge Mountains, Hooker gives chase. Uh, Halleck and Lincoln find a, an excuse to relieve him late in June, and he's replaced with George Meade. Uh, in the meantime, Lee is struggling rather blindly into Pennsylvania because his cavalry chief, uh, J.E.B. Stewart, has decided to go on a big ride around the federal position and not report back in. Yes, he's trying to repeat what he had done the year before. Yes. Uh, so Lee is actually north uh, and west of Gettysburg and gets information that the Army of the Potomac has left the Washington area the, in Virginia and has followed him uh, north. So he turns back around and he wants to concentrate in a small town of Gettysburg. And the interesting thing about Gettysburg is that several roads all come together in this one point. Um, so Lee's troops are, are moving in from the Northwest, and a plucky Kentuckian, John Buford, uh, at the head of a cavalry division, uh, meets the Confederate troops on Seminary Ridge, just west of town, uh, because Buford knows how important the high ground is. He so just he, didn't do it. Yes, his uh, he likes to fight his cavalry as dismounted cavalry. No charges, no sabers, none of that business. And they have breech-loading carbines. So they can get down behind cover and hold off large numbers of Confederates. And this is what Buford does. Uh, meanwhile, sending for the man who is thought to be probably one of the, or the best general uh, of the Union Army, uh, John Reynolds. Um, Reynolds comes up, brings his corps, but Reynolds is killed. Uh, almost immediately after arriving, and the Union forces are in a little bit of disarray, and they are flanked. So now they're getting pressure from two sides, and so they fall back to the east uh, and southeast through the town and begin to establish positions on the high ground um, that Buford sought to protect. This is Culp's Hill and... Cemetery Ridge. Yes, I think I have that right. Yeah. And uh, and that's where we are. Then that's this big what if uh, that Francis wants to dive into first. It's been discussed many, many times. Um, as the Union men are taking up positions on Culp's Hill, there's still daylight. And because Lee reorganized the Army of Northern Virginia, uh, after Jackson's death, um, he split Jackson's command into two corps, one commanded by A.T. Hill and one commanded by Richard Ewell. 
And, and you can do a little bit of Longstreet's core too to, to yes, store those up. Yeah, because Longstreet and Jackson were uh, basically the same size, and you kind of take what you, what was two and became three. So yeah. it's, it's, there's quite a bit of, of a change. Of, of mixing up there. But Lee famously gives kind of elastic orders and trusted Longstreet and Jackson to interpret those orders <laughs> and make something out of them. Ewell is not that kind of soldier. Ewell needs more definite, precise instructions. Uh, but the instructions he gets is, uh, are, are, take that hill if practical. Yeah, the famous quotation, yes. Yes. Um, so again, Jackson probably would have interpreted Lee's take that hill if practical and is that, well, of course it's practical. I've got great a great set of men here, we can do it. Ewell was much more cautious and decided not to take action on the first day. And that allowed the Union uh, troops to concentrate very heavily on Culp's Hill for the right. second unopposed. day. Unopposed, almost totally unopposed. Yes, at that point. yes. Um, one of the interesting things to me about this whole reorganization um, is, in a way, it shows the, 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 the dearth of, of military genius on the south side. Um, they don't go through nearly the, the, the generals after the, the first year that, that the North continues to do until Grant comes along, uh, mainly because they don't have them, but also because the guys they do end up with at the top are so good uh, as generals. But once you get past the first, the, the first team, which is Lee, Longstreet, and Jackson, the, the drop-off is staggering. It really is. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you had taken the ego out of Joe Johnston and uh, Beauregard, maybe they would have been good corps commanders under uh, Lee, but you know, their ego was their, their downfall. And without having somebody who could command a large corps-sized group of men, and not worry about the details of what happens after I take the hill. Because I think that was Jewel's big issue. Well, what happens after I get up there? I can't hold it. But somebody like Jackson or probably even Longstreet would have taken it and trusted that the, the rest of the army would have backed them up. Yeah, right. You know, they could have made it. Jewel was operating in a vacuum. And that, I think, was his biggest downfall. Uh, as a corps commander, he didn't understand that other guys had his back, uh, luckily for the Union. You know, and, and so few of these general officers on either side, I mean, we've, we've, we've been rather harsh on just about everybody from both sides, but so few of them had any experience with large formations uh, right. to begin with. Um, you know, all of a sudden commanding corps and divisions and all, it's it's foreign nobody's done that since Zachary Taylor almost well and the size of the armies that uh, you know uh, the size of any one corps would have been at least on the south side would have been almost as large as the entire pre-war army if not yep. larger yeah sure yeah so because the nobody had the experience except uh, Winfield Scott and that was from a desk so in the field nobody had this experience they were all learning as they went. Yeah, There's a philosophical like difference that. there, too, yeah. uh, the, how, how they do this. Uh, Lee was actually pretty wise when he, he, he set it up with two large cores with Jackson and Longstreet, guys that he trusted who could execute well. Uh, and that way, it's a very short, quick pivot for his orders to get to the men. Whereas in the Union case, and this is uh, very much illustrative of the divisions that they had amongst them, is they had much smaller corps and they had many more of them, so they're constantly in fighting trying to get the glory. And that's why you bring in idiots, and I'll, and I'll go ahead and say it, uh, until Ulysses S. Grant shows up and cuts through all this, that are really almost out for themselves. And the war effort yeah, suffers it's, in many ways. It's a war egos. council of 15 versus a uh, three-man discussion. <laughs> <laughs> That's correct. And, mm -hmm. and, all the, and those three men, two of them knew exactly who was really in charge. Uh, right. And, and because, understood, and, and they all understood how they operated. Correct. And, you know, and that comes to play in this battle. Hill, 
into that mix to make what was a three-man operation into a four, where the roles are uncertain now, uh, you know, it was probably the worst time that, both the best and the worst time that Lee could have chosen to invade the North. Best time because they were on a roll, but the worst time because he had two-thirds of his army was under uncertain command. Yeah, and it's and I don't want to I don't want to be too harsh on Yule or Hill. They were inexperienced at this level. I mean, they were in the major leagues now. They were really good. Both of them had proven themselves as excellent division commanders. Which is duh. What are you going to do? Of course, to get to command a corps, you go down to the next level, which is division, and you bring a guy up, whoever's the best. But uh, what was it, Martin? You talk about the Peter principle a lot. Yeah. Maybe that's where yeah. we found ourselves. Is these guys were fine as divisional commanders, but they were out of their depth. And I think that's exactly what happened. In many respects, the thing, the same was the same with the Union, because Reynolds, and I, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but Reynolds had an independent command of half the army when he arrives at Gettysburg. Meade is in the back, and he is, because Reynolds actually was almost offered full command. He wouldn't want to take it, because uh, he was actually senior to Meade, uh, because that's how things wor worked in the, in the North. But he was so well-respected, so trusted, so efficient at what he did, that he was able to give this uh, independent command, and his absence the next three days leaves an enormous vacuum, uh, and the, the the union reorganizes because they have to, as best well, they can. You know, but his a, absence is a big issue. It is, you know. I think that's the unspoken big what if from the that's union right. side. I mean, we talk, we've talked about many times what if uh, things had gone differently on Little Round Top with Chamberlain? What if he gets killed, or what if he's a little bit slower moving to take that hill? That's right. Um, but really, what if Reynolds isn't killed? What if they don't have to blunder about that first day trying to get themselves reorganized? Mm -hmm. You know, Does he then go after Ewell head on instead of the Army of the Potomac, you know, his first corps trying to figure out what the hell's going on? So... Because you know, they're in the heat of battle. They're right there. The opposition, right. they are pushed back at Re after Reynolds' death. What if they weren't pushed back? What if the exactly. lines formed differently? Uh, and that's kind of where we're going with this whole scenario here with, uh, with Jackson. Uh, because, as, as we said, the lost cause is really about Jackson takes the hill that Ewell doesn't. That's really the micro, which yeah. really is not fair to anybody. It's really kind of a silly thing because where we go with this is really very different. Martin. Well, Francis, I just wanted you to explore that a little as a historian, uh, as, a, as thinking about it as a military historian. Okay, so Jackson takes the hill. Oh, play that then one out? What? Yeah. yeah, yeah play well, it out. Yeah, that's the whole point yeah, of the episode. Right, right? Because that's correct, that's, because it is. Uh, if, 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 again, it's, it's, it's static. It's a static analysis, which is not realistic, but just for the sake of argument, we can presume, and this is the whole lost cause piece was, Jackson is aggressive and he's organized. Ewell is less so in either one. Uh, he does not delay. He moves forward. In fact, there's a moment in the movie Gettysburg where the great actor uh, W. Morgan Shepard comes forth and says, we could have taken that hill. It's a very dramatic moment. Yes. Uh, that's kind of giving voice to this understanding of all that happened off screen because you can't show everything. But if the, the, you have to understand Culp's Hill is on one side. Uh, Little Round Top is on completely on the other side, and they're all high ground, which the Union uh, occupies over, uh, during the night after the first day in efficient well, formation. The famous fish hold fishing on a second, formation. Though. Hold on, though. they don't occupy the entire fish book that first night. That's true. They well, uh, parts of it. They don't get but, the Little Round Top until the late in the second day, uh, when Chamberlain arrives just in time to meet Longstreet's troops. Right. Yeah, so, they, they, they plan on it. They've got parts of it. Uh, they're still forming. But Culp's Hill right. forms early because they're unopposed. And it's a strong right. position. And, right. So what happens then if they are denied Culp's Hill? That means that there's been a battle, and whatever troops are involved in that battle are going to be in disarray for the next day. Right. So what you basically got to, is you've got Jackson's, uh, I don't want to say exhausted, but tired troops occupying Culp's Hill and, and setting up artillery. So basically you've got two forces the, fa facing each other uh, right there. Uh, therefore the Union has to push itself back. It's not able to occupy the full heights. So you've got these two forces here. That's the staging area. That's what right. Ewell wanted was to be able to say this is the strong point. We can't take that. 
uh, Jackson would say, well, now it's our strong point. We have taken that. We're going to use this as a staging area to roll up the federal line. That's their intention. So the battle itself will be what uh, wh right there where those two forces meet. Uh, and how, how far they, they advance beyond Culp's Hill, I don't know. They'll probably occupy that. So you've got these, this, the whole tenor of the battle changes because Lee will now have the ability to cut. He's got a staging area. Uh, well, he's got the staging area no matter what because right. he knows the Federals are not going to attack him. Right, but it's a strong point. But, uh, where, well, it's a point which invites attack more so than, than where he was because y you either have to leave or you have to attack that ground because you can't seed that ground. So right. you're, suggesting a uh, you're suggesting that Lee all of a sudden does what Longstreet would have wanted and fights a more defensive war, a defensive battle at Culp's Hill. It depends entirely on what the Federals do, and I think that's what Martin is trying to get to. Right, yeah. because the wishful thinking end of this, again, you, when you connect this to Lost Cause, right. the thinking is, okay, now we've got the high ground, and the Yanks are going to have to try to dislodge us. But do they? Remember, yeah. it's critical yeah. here that Meade isn't really on the scene. He's working through Hancock. And Hancock is the one who really picks the ground because they've occupied Culp's Hill. So think about it this way. Okay, Jackson's men take Culp's Hill. The Union's not obligated to attack to, and try yeah, to take to, it back. Or to stay where they would have been otherwise. Exactly. I mean, again, it's the, this idea that, well, this would have changed the battle because now the Yanks are the ones trying to take the high ground. But they already had yeah. a defensive plan in Maryland. They could have just said, well, okay, we lost a little encounter battle, a one-day thing. We're going to fall back to Maryland and get between Lee and home and now see what happens. Do you really think that the political pressure would have allowed him to do that, though? Well, that's the thing. That's where I was going to go. It depends entirely on what Lincoln decides because this is as far north as the South has ever gotten. They never got into Pennsylvania yeah. before. So it might be entirely untenable for him to let them have anything to do with Pennsylvania. He might have to say to them, and he might, he, we can't let, we can't just walk away from this one. Uh, it may be, and again, he's not a military genius either. Yeah, you know, he stumbles so, about with this too. His main thing is you got to start attacking them and keep attacking them, but that's as far as his military acumen goes. So if he pushes them to attack here, it could be disastrous for them, but it might not because, again, where do they fall back to on the first day? Right. It all they, depends. They, yeah. It, it, it all to depends back to on choosing the ground. It what really kind does. Of pressure, yeah. What kind of pressure do Lincoln and Halleck put on Meade? Are they willing to give Meade – again, he's only been in command like three days, and he's not even there yet. He doesn't even arrive until like the middle of the night. Right. Uh, if he can tell Halleck, look, I've got a defensive position set up. I don't want to hit this high ground here. We'll get clobbered, just like we did at Fredericksburg. Does Halleck give him a little bit of room to, to then get control of his command? Again, they're all kind of all over the place, too. He's trying to bring seven corps to bear here. Yeah, and some of them aren't even there yet. And well, that, we're which talking 90,000 men. Yeah, yeah, which oh, that's yeah. something we have to recognize too is that uh, just to assemble these, that's why the real, but the real true battle of the armies isn't until the third day when everybody's there. Yeah. Uh, it's still piecemeal in certain times, and it's constantly growing. It's 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 a it's a move upwards. I think you're onto something, guys. It really is something about where is the ground chosen, and just because you take Culp's Hill does not mean that you have all of a sudden this staging area to attack the Federals, assuming the Federals would be static. They wouldn't. They'd react differently. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I don't think they would withdraw. I, I think uh, Lee makes the same decision himself uh, uh, between that first and second day. He says, we're here. I cannot ask this army to turn away and face a battle. Meade's going to say the same darn thing. Uh, he, he recognizes, I think, I because of the, the pressure. I don't know. I don't know. Lee's now, got to take long chances. Lee well, has to take the long chances. Yeah. Meade doesn't have to. Not yet, because he's just gotten the army. Right. If, if right. he hasn't lost like the said, battle, it, he'd have to. Yeah, it's all about that political pressure. If they're willing to give Meade a little latitude here, 
and recognize he has a defensive line set up in Maryland, and he's he's getting this core together. They can kind of let this just be a one-day encounter battle and walk well, not walk away, but they can redeploy. Whereas I think that's something uh, that Longstreet, Longstreet wanted to do. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, well, that's something that Longstreet didn't really understand. I think was where Lee was. Is I think Lee's feeling like there are no really other choices here. Uh, yeah, with they, Jackson here though, I, I there's you know. You always have to keep going. Well, if they do this, what happens here? And then if he does this, what happens here? Because so if Jackson's on Culp Hill, which I think we we agree, he probably is able to take it because he's yeah. got balls. Not right. that Wool didn't. He just Jackson knew how to use his. Yeah. And the the Federals just weren't. You know, they the guys who were there, they'd been fighting all day. Whereas Jackson's men, even though they'd been marching, they were they were going to be more fresh because marching is better than fighting. As right. far as being able to stay fresh, so if they're able to take it, they can dig in. They'll have overnight to rest as more replacements are coming up. So then the question becomes, when they see where the Federals are the next morning, because that's the only time they're going to see it, because the because Jeb Stewart does not arrive until late, late that first night, or late the second night. Second, second. night. Second, second night. So, right. but he's not even a factor yet. Yeah, I mean, that that's it's only it's only the scouts they years. send out to 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 uh, and. and this happens, you know, the, the Lee's Council of War, uh, the, the second day, is all about the federal position was scouted during the night, and this is what we came up with, the fishhook position. Uh, right. the, they'll do the same thing uh, with the new configuration, and it may be an, an abbreviated fishhook. They can't take Culp's Hill, but they can take everything else. Well, how close are they going to be, though? There's still going to have to be some kind of gap, because the artillery can pound them. That's uh, correct. If, if and they're so in the open. Um, if, so if, if, I don't know that they even take any part of the fish hook that they had before. Maybe they go to little round top and big round top, but I don't know. But you know, those are pretty wooded, so I don't know how much they can do there either. Maybe they don't want to set up in the town because that's a losing proposition. Right. So, uh, and honestly, I don't have the the terrain map in front of me, uh, but I don't know that if if they if they are if they don't take the anchor point at Culp's Hill. I don't know that they can take any of the rest of the line, and, and that is make a it very good point. Very uh, good point. Yeah. And if that's the case, the entire if that's in case the whole what if is the Battle of Gettysburg truly never happens. Exactly. That's skirmish. Yeah. That's kind of yeah. where we're going it's, with this. It's a one day it's, skirmish and not a three day encounter and, battle. And, and, and Robert had a really good point earlier too. And, and Francis, I'm sorry, I, I wanted to just pivot to this because not only all of this what if, but Robert pointed out hey, this army might not even have moved in the same way with Jackson in command. Oh, well, there's uh, no que- there's, there has actually you know, no question and, about that, and, just and, what we know about him. You know, Heath is ordered to go into the town, uh, and, and I think it becomes apocryphal later on that supposedly he's looking for shoes. That's, yeah, that's uh, what we... Like, that's so well, you've already been through this town once. You would have cleaned it out if there were any, and there's no factories, and there, you know, it's not a railroad... Uh, depot or anything, so I think that's uh, you know he was covering something there, uh, right. c- covering his gluteal well, appendage. Well, but, yeah, and, and Heath was a bit of a loose cannon anyway, and it's very possible he would not have been given. Uh, well, it's, it's not possible; it's certain. Uh, yeah. If he's under under Jackson, he would not have. You know, Jackson no. was famous for court martialing guys for going off on their own. Uh, yeah. uh, Rich, Richard Brooke Garnet is, yeah. is the great example of that. Garnet, yeah. It, 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 yeah, and uh, in fact, that's why Garner essentially commits suicide by charge uh, uh, to to redeem his name. A, a terrible tragedy, among many other tragedies of this whole battle. Uh, and you're, you're right; the battle may never have. And I think that's where I want to segue into uh, is away from the lost cause myth and into a real what if. Uh, if Jackson lives, the the reorg never happens. We can probably as safely assume that uh, the invasion of the North does. But that's about all we can say. <laughs> so well, before we, that's kind of the main thrust of this. But, you know, boys, we got to have a sip of bourbon before we go there. Uh, I've got mine right here. 
Uh, Woodford Reserve, I have cracked open. Uh, my sister gave me a gift box last year for Christmas. I hadn't touched it yet, but tonight was the night. So I, I opened it. It's not double oaked, Robert. I know that's your, kind of your favorite well, thing. I'm drinking the double oaked. So oh, my coming. goodness. Go. Well, I guess I might have to do twice as much to equal what you're doing. Uh, since I'm at home and not driving, I suppose I can do that. Uh, although I suppose that uh, if we, this goes on for too long, I'll start to slur, and that's not very good. Yeah, yeah. So Martin, I'm, what you got? I'm working the larceny, and uh, we need to get together in person soon because daggone it, that larceny is lasting far too long. We need to help you finish that one off. I was well, just thinking that same thing. That's We've right. got to move on to something else soon. <laughs> I've got once once we can get together uh, here in the brand new refurbished and upgraded Studio M as I call it, on the 30th floor of the Nakatomi Plaza, uh, we are going to crack open a bottle of Bullet. Oh. Yes, uh, we've been talking about special that. Special for this. I and, don't know uh, that we've mentioned that on air yet, but we have now. That's kind of where yes, we're going to go we next. Have. And uh, Martin has said when we finally gather together in person again, and it should be soon, Bullet is where we're going to go. Not the Steve McQueen movie, but although that's very cool too, but the bourbon. Uh, which is very, very good. Uh, I haven't had that in some time. I've had it uh, at other places, but I've never actually had it. You know, to be honest, guys, bourbon is good, but bourbon with all three of us together is even better. That's the whole point. Is, is exactly. Uh, uh, it, it's uh, always best to be shared with good friends. Yeah, and, and listeners, I, just, uh, I was talking a little bit about the newly upgraded Studio M, as I call it here. Um, Studio M has its own bar. And uh, I am going to name the bar. I, that is a bit of a conceit, I guess, to name your, your household bar. But I am going to name it Nightfall, with a K, uh, for uh, our Bellarmine heritage uh, for the three of us. So we're going to have a, a great place to celebrate and remember and all those great things um, that happen when we're together in recording. Well, Amen to that. Cheers. cheers. Uh, yeah, I can, I can, I can clink with my bottle, I suppose, uh, to, to make to give us drink from the bottle. No, no, no. Hey, I'm not beyond that, I suppose. But no, actually, I got a real because this was a gift box. I got a really good crystal glass uh, with the Woodford nice. Reserve. Uh, you guys oh, can see this nice. on the video with the Woodford so, Reserve logo on it. So you guys can't tell, even though we we have video. I don't, you guys might be able to see if I put it up close enough, but. Um, uh, I have a, um, a new set of glasses that uh, my buddy Keith, or, or actually no, uh, I have to show it to my buddy Keith, but um, the girls got me for Father's Day. Uh, it is bourbon glass, uh, a set of two, and it is uh, baseball themed. So you, you have a map of the area around Comerica Park and the old English D for the oh, Tigers. For, for, your, yeah, the for, your, for, your, for the Tigers, that's correct. Yeah. Yes, nobody gets to hate on the tigers on on snakes and otters. It's just doesn't that's right. That's my job. Or, or the lions, or the red wings, or any of that sort of stuff. So, uh, that's right. so that's quite okay. Uh, you know, I, I give well, a Martin, little bit of grief on the lions. <laughs> well, you know, I, I give just as good as I can on the on the, the cowboys too. So, this is true. Yeah. This is true. But uh, before we get too far off the off to the off into the uh, beaten path here. Let's do a real what if on this. Well, well Martin, you have something. Uh, no, just uh, giving you a little signal about our time. Oh, okay, no problem. That's all right. We're good. Uh, before we uh, listeners, before we started this episode, Martin was uh, repeated two or three times. Don't worry about time. This episode, we're just going to keep rolling, keep rolling. <laughs> so uh, uh, we've actually gone a little long, but we know that we we expected Gettysburg to do this. Uh, we have well, talked about the. The, the 20 minute uh, interlude for the uh, context of the, the current situation, then we are really going to go long. Sure. Um, uh, let me, we, uh, let me take the lead on this. Uh, you Please. guys have both done a good job laying out the uh, both the setup and the uh, the battle there. Allows um, me to drink more bourbon. Uh, yes, drink more bourbon. Um, and I think this is where I went in some of our show prep, so I, uh, so I want to go ahead and uh, lay this out. So if if Jackson doesn't get shot, or even if he does and he doesn't die, say it's just a minor wound, whatever you want to call it, the important thing is that Jackson is alive at the end of Chancellorsville. So there's a lot of things that, that both get set into motion as well as are no longer set in motion because of this. First of all, the, the, the Southern Army is not thrown into total disarray. Uh, you know, it, it, they are paralyzed for pro what is probably several weeks uh, dealing with Jackson's death. 
and that is something that uh, can, I don't think can be mis, uh, misunderstood or underestimated because he was, you know, he, he was mythic even in his own time. His men truly loved him. They feared him, but they loved him. Yeah. And then taking his core and part of Longstreet's core and now making them two, making three out of the two, uh, has a profound effect because you're now you're dividing up men who uh, have been fighting together, mixing them up, and you're changing that structure. And you're putting in charge two men that had never uh, ha had any inkling of that kind of command before. Uh, they had done fine as divisional commanders, as, as uh, Francis has pointed out. And so I think a couple of things are going to happen with Jackson being alive. The cores stay two. They, there's no splitting into into uh, into three. Now you make the argument that really it's four core after Jackson's death because there's the cavalry is almost as, it's its own separate core uh, because uh, Stuart really has a relatively independent uh, command for the most part. Uh, yep. So you've got Jackson and Longstreet and Stuart, and when they go north, it could very well be a month sooner than they did originally. So that throws everything else uh, into disarray as well. They're going sooner. Um, the the weather is going to be different. Uh, you know, it's going to be much easier to go north uh, uh, in uh, in rather in, you know, in June rather than July. Even though the north is going to be cooler, it's still going to be pretty freaking hot in July. Right. And right. you know, you're talking about guys are wearing wool uniforms. Uh, so there, you know, all these little things are going to change the outcome of this invasion because they're still going north. There's no way Lee is not going to go north after Chancellorsville. Agreed. Yeah, that yeah, that was it's just a question as you say of when and how. Yes, and where. I think with yeah. Jackson and having two corps, the route is even going to be different. Because without having to divide your your army into three corps and yeah. take, and really that three corps is divided into multiple parts as well because you can't take 75,000 men north all on one road. Right, Yule's at the to complete uh, the north, and uh, Hill is behind him, and Longstreet's all the way at the back. Right. So when the when when the pivot comes uh, to, to to go go towards Gettysburg, Hill is the one who moves laterally, so to speak. Yule has to come return from his northern area down south, and they converge on the first day there at Gettysburg. Yule from the north, and Hill from the west, and. That configuration is, you know, assume, of course, I think I'm, am I sensing you right here, Robert? They don't probably ever meet at Gettysburg. They meet somewhere No, else. I don't think they do. Because yeah. you also have to factor in whether or not Joe Hooker is still in charge of the Army of the Potomac at this time. Right? Because well, well, that's a good question. Do you, how could he not, how could Meade not have taken ascendancy Well, here? you just, you pointed it out, though, early on. He had only been in charge of the Army of the Potomac for like three days. He took over at the end of June. If right. they go at the end of May or the beginning of June, Hooker's still in charge. And I don't, you, you don't see Lincoln Halleck, and Halleck, Halleck and Lincoln have pushing. To find it. They don't have time to do reason. Yeah, they have they have to make Hooker go. They can't. Uh, they don't exactly. have time to mess around. There, there's right. there's some there's some valid truth to that. I can see that. Uh, when I Meade think Meade was yeah. Uh, go ahead. They don't realize that that uh, that Lee is on the march and is already in Maryland, right? So, or at least part of the army is because, you know, like, again, it takes a while to get all those men from one place to the other. So, yeah, I think they're stuck with Hooker. And what Hooker does is going to um, make a difference uh, in, in how the fight goes. You know, does he uh, live up to fighting Joe Hooker and try to meet them as early as possible? Maybe. Mm. You know, so yeah. maybe they don't meet in uh, Pennsylvania at all. Maybe it's another uh, Maryland. Another Antietam? Yeah. Ooh, that's interesting. I, I, I'm not sure I'm, I'm willing to say Hooker stays. Uh, I, I get it. Uh, or, or, well, I'm not going to say that. I'm, I'm willing to say Hooker stays. I'm not sure Hooker rises to where he needs to rise to. That I, I might you know, be I'm, I'm still shell-shocked after, after Chancellorsville. That's right. And uh, yeah, I, he's I think, preparing... He's preparing a defensive line in Maryland at Pipe Creek. That's his plan. He right, wants to stay purely on the defensive. Yeah, yeah, and right. I think you're right that Lincoln ain't going to put up with that defensive shit at this point. 
uh, that's one of the reasons Meade was was chosen is because Hooker's going to fight a what a defensive war here uh, and Lee's well, invading the North. I don't think so. Right, but to get to that point where he says to to Hooker, all right, you're out. We can't do this. That's going to have to give Lee time to run amok in the North because that's right. got to happen before quicker. he can replace Hooker at this right. point. Because if Lee is on the move, it would be disastrous to replace Hooker immediately without knowing anything. You know, right? Probably. I mean, it's going to be disastrous to replace anybody in your commanding general in the middle of a battle on most occasions. He got away with it at Gettysburg, I think because of the lack of good generalship compared to, to Stonewall. Uh, it, we, you know, we got away with something there. I don't well, think don't, don't underestimate Meade too much. Meade was a very fine army commander. He was a better corps commander, but he was because uh, he retained the command of the Army of the Potomac for the rest of the war. We forget that sometimes. He yeah, was never relieved. He he, he did, he but was, once he was once better, Grant was there, once Grant comes in, that's right. The boss is he, with him. Grant may be the ar- the general of all the armies, but yeah. when the only army you're dealing with is the Army of the Potomac, that's right. You're really yeah, still the commanding general. It's, it's really, it's you're right. It's it's kind of a it's kind of fuzzy math here uh, of how that works because, and I don't know, and I'm, I don't want to take us off off subject for a second, but if you have you gentlemen seen the uh, History Channel uh, three part Grant series mini series they have done just recently? No, I've not seen no, it. Yet. I did not. Oh, oh yeah. boys, well you you really need to watch it. Uh, it really lays it out so so well. It's it's not just a biopic. It is fantastic. We really need to watch it before we do Vicksburg next time, because next month because it really does lay a lot of this out. And the second episode ends with the Battle of the Wilderness, um, and that's where uh, and, and the wilderness is dealt with very very strongly. So is uh, so is Vicksburg in particular. I mean Shiloh, but Sh- is Shiloh, Vicksburg, and the Wilderness are kind of the three big battles that get covered. Now, they cover all of them, but those are the big ones. And what changed with Grant, and again, I'm going a little off field, off field here, but I try, I'm trying to make a point, is that they, when they got their ass whooped, and they did at the Wilderness, they got their ass whooped. It was definitely not an, a Union victory. Uh, the Confederates very much knew the area but far better. They were all wondering, are we going to do, when this is over, like we've done every single other time, is retreat and go back north and lick our wounds like Hooker did. And he wasn't the only one. Uh, yeah. And then he, But Grant turns south as right. soon as they leave there, and that's the change. Meade was a great executor. He, I'm not so sure he was the strategist on all this. Uh, you put the army in his command, he's going to fight the battle. But he proves after the battle that he doesn't really have the strategic chops because he, he makes that stupid communication to, Le- to Lincoln afterwards, we have driven the invaders from our soil, which of course enrages Lincoln, and he says, when will, they, when will the people understand it's all our soil? Right, but I think you're presuming something you cannot necessarily presume. I don't know that necessarily Meade gets the army. What if Reynolds oh, gets it? Oh, I see what you're... Okay. Yeah, so, I mean, if Reynolds has a little bit bigger ambition to him... Uh, I don't know that we can say command. we can make that what if. That's a, that's. A, uh, I will say this though. But it throws it up. My point is though, with Hooker still in charge. Yeah. When Lee starts north, because I think that's going to be the case, because it is in in the real history, and so a month earlier, it's got to still be the case. All right, I'll take um, that. Let, let's so, let's let's put a pin in that one and say that's that's the case. Is that so, it's Joe Hook Hooker that is in charge uh, as all this new what if happens. The right. invasion continues so forth somewhere. It continues forth. They'll probably still take relatively the same path north. Uh, part of the army is going to be on one side of the Shenandoah, and part of the other uh, army is going to be on the other side. Okay, because that's the really the, the Blue Ridge. Yeah, the Blue Ridge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, and you're right. That strategically, tactically, that makes all the sense in the world. I don't see where that changes. Right. Uh, Just the disposition of the commanders and the, and the particular divisions in those corps are yeah. going to be what's different. But you've got Jackson um, out in front here. And yes, you, got, you probably still have Jackson. fast. Right. Well, yes. So depending on how the disposition is at Pikes Creek and how far along that defense is, um, you know, it may be that they go for that because it's, it's a month earlier. Maybe they're not ready to take on Lee's army that quickly. So mm-hmm. maybe the battle does happen at Pikes Creek. Uh, what happens to Hooker then? Uh, is is Meade available or willing to take on the army at that point? 
do they do they push Reynolds for it at that point? Uh, you know, like I said, I think Reynolds dying on the first day is one of the biggest what ifs from the union side. It, it is. I don't think. Well, Reynolds. We've got a history here with Reynolds, knowing that he refused because he was. He was. He wasn't quite offered, but he was pretty much approached for it, and he kind of turned it down. I don't think that's changeable at this point, even if Jackson lives. But I do think Reynolds long term is a major factor here. Uh, I I think Meade probably would get the call when the call comes, because. Unless Hooker shows some aggressive behavior about I'm going to pursue, uh, that's where the problem, I think, comes. Because I, I think there's one thing you can guarantee. Lincoln will be hot on the Army's back. You will pursue into the north. You, you must do that. Uh, well, that whether presumes that the, that the Army of Northern Virginia bypasses Pikes Creek. Oh, I think I think I would agree with that. I think they, but I think they would. I don't, I don't know. I, the reason I say I don't know is because you're a month earlier. The position is far less prepared a month earlier than it is when they go north for real. I don't so think that I, could be a, And with Jackson there, yeah. that could be a very tempting target. And you're remember, right. The whole goal is to draw the Army of the Potomac out into battle and destroy it. That's correct. And if he sees them sitting there. Uh, in a weak and vulnerable position, he well, answer me this then. Jackson would certainly see that. Could he convince Lee of that to change his strategy of Probably invading the North? Maybe. I, I think he could because, again, it goes back to that relationship between those two men that was, at this point, so very critical. And Longstreet, too. Uh, and that, it's a totally different situation because you yeah. know, the, the army is, is not divided as, as it is. I mean, there's so much that is – I mean, everything is thrown wide open with, with Jackson living – that the path chosen is going to still be relatively the same because of geography. The timing makes it different because they're probably going to go sooner. That timing is going to be, uh, cause a different landscape for them to march north on because I just don't see the Army of the Potomac being as well dug in at, at uh, Pikes Creek. That might be too tempting of a target. It might Maybe. not. I, I, I'm saying that if that could be one way or the other. That's but a if good they question, go north, who, who Hooker is. may not... Uh, order his men to try and intercept in the same way uh, this at this point as he does before he gets replaced, or maybe he does. That's you know, a good it could question. be that we still un end up, if not in Gettysburg, then somewhere nearby. I, I think it's almost impossible for him not to move away from Pikes Creek once the invasion of the North begins. Uh, it's just a question of when, as you say. Uh, well, it also depends on how well Stuart screens that move north. Because well, that's correct, can, because we're presuming uh, – one of the reasons Gettysburg comes out the way that it is, one of the major reasons, is because Stuart is gone. He's yeah. riding up north getting his name in the papers, as I said in the movie. Uh, and with, with, if he is doing his job properly and properly screens the army, Jackson knows what's coming and when they're coming, and he's going to turn to meet them. Jackson does not want to allow the Federals – uh, to choose the ground, which is ultimately what happens in the real battle, battle of Gettysburg. Uh, Jackson's and not going to permit that if he can. Right, and I submit that if you have those three generals, Stuart, Longstreet, and Jackson, all under Lee's direction, obviously, uh, being able to work in concert, I think that like could they be already disastrous done. for the Army of the Potomac because you know the, the way they worked best was... Um, Stuart causing havoc and doing his job screening, and then Jackson being that hammer, hammer against Longstreet's anvil. And if you yeah. can catch the Army of the Potomac between those three elements, uh, because of the brashness and boldness and the, the success that, that they had run up prior to that point, you know, honestly, I'm shocked that the North did as well as it did at Gettysburg because it was all against them. They'd had a string of horrific losses. Yeah, they morale just had a change in generalship. Yeah, and all of those things say there's no way that we should have won that battle, but we did. Well, well, a lot of it was because Jackson was not there, and well, the disorganization yes, yes. that comes from that. Even though uh, Longstreet was, I, I, we all think Longstreet is one of the greatest tactical and strategic geniuses that ever walked a battlefield. But I don't really. Can we? Could we have convinced? Could Jackson have convinced Lee to bring about battle uh, against a disorganized army of the Potomac when the strategy was invade the North and bring them to you? And here's why I say that is because we know that 
on the first day of Gettysburg, Lee is very clear, I want no army, I want no battle until this army is all up and concentrated. Uh, and that Heath, as we've already discussed, goes rogue and starts something he shouldn't have. Now, give Lee credit, he recognizes, well, shit, it's happening, we're going to have to roll with it, let's do that. Well, would he, would, how, much of, how much of a latitude would Lee have given Jackson here uh, to, well, think, uh, to decide, asking, let's, go ahead and go, let, let's go ahead and attack them here? I don't know that that, and that might be a bridge too far. I don't know. I think they're going to well, want to bring them to them. They're going to want a defensive battle. I think his attitude at Gettysburg is predicated on the fact that, that Jackson is gone. Would he have mm-hmm. been that cautious? Ooh, interesting. 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 Now, now he once wanted his to keep years together, he's not cautious. Yeah. He wanted to keep tighter control on Ewell and Hill than he would have on Jackson. Oh, yeah. no question as to that. He would not but, have been concerned about Jackson going into the town without Longstreet. Yeah, right. he would have. Ne- he would. Yeah, but and he would have never Hill, done what he did. Yeah. Yeah. You know, with Ewell and Hill, he doesn't want them going off on their own until he can get Longstreet up. Right, because so, Longstreet's the, the most experienced commander. Yeah, uh, so Robert's absolutely that right. That is a huge difference. Yeah. You know, pre-day, going back beyond Culp's Hill, that's the real what if, is what does Jackson decide to do at the beginning? Yes, um, you're, you're exactly right. That's you know, what's so fascinating because, about this whole discussion. Is yeah. it's, it's, the real what if is how does it all lay out? Yeah, and, because you know, Buford and Reynolds are the guys – that recognize if we protect the high ground here, we've got a chance to win regardless. Correct. What they are in Jackson many respects do, the real heroes. Of they are. Buford and Reynolds are the heroes. They pick it out. Hancock's on the scene. He backs them up. Right. And then Meade says, well, okay, I'll take your word for it. We'll go with this. Right, we're so, engaged. We can't disengage. Well, yeah, point. and I, you, I, I, I don't like to, I don't like to disparage Meade much anyway. I think no, he no, was I'm, a far better commander. No, and we're not. Uh, I, I think he was a far better commander. Uh, he was he, after, years after this, he always styled himself as Meade of Gettysburg, because he did bring about something that was at this point well, it never really happened. Uh, you can't really count Antietam as a real victory. I mean, that's kind of like moving the goalposts a little bit. Uh, uh, this one here was an absolute, for sure, Union victory. Oh, absolutely. And it was the biggest victory to date, by far. Correct. Uh, well, we, we might make an, uh, an exception for Vicksburg, but certainly in the East. Vicksburg yeah. happens a day later. Yeah, that Vicksburg is correct. That's right. You're, you're exactly so, right, sir. That's meet exactly right. for the first big win, uh, you know, bigger, bigger scale than Donaldson or Shiloh or any place. Yeah. Now, but, Shiloh does come a good second, though, at this yeah. point. Now, i, I got to say, though, that and I said this earlier, I still I still believe, and this may have been during show prep, I still think that even if Vicksburg had gone on or, or Grant had had to abandon uh, Vicksburg, um, what happens at Gettysburg is still far more important. Uh, I think what Vicksburg does is shorten the war by probably a couple of years. I uh, think, yeah, year. yeah, I think because, Vicksburg is the better strategic victory, but... Well, because it brings Grant east. That's correct. And the longer and, Grant stays in the West, the greater the chance Lee has of uh, defeating the Army in the East. If you defeat the Army in the East, you take Washington D.C. If you take Washington right. D.C., the North has to sue for peace almost almost inevitably. Yeah, and that's what Grant. I mean, that's what Lee was after all that right. time. He and he and rightfully so. I mean, strategic genius that he was. He recognized this is very possible here. Uh, they are inept in many ways. Part of that was systematic and structural uh, because of their uh, in, insane egos and infighting. The structures they had was not near as smart as the Confederate structures because they were more top-down. Uh, they were, uh, surprisingly, the collegiality and the uh, cooperation that supposedly the Union was doing worked against them because well, yeah, we, uh, until Grant came with a, with a one-man is in charge approach, the Union lost time after time after time. Well, and I think that, that part of that, those early failures um, are, it's the structure, but I think part of the early successes for the, for the South uh, is not just the structure, but also the reason that it's called the lost cause is that the South truly had a cause that well, was true. a unifying cause. Uh, that was separation in order to do certain things. Primarily, primarily preserve slavery, 
Right. But also, uh, as a corollary to that, because to them it was it was nearly as important was that individual states' rights, which is the cause that lived on. Right. Uh, yeah. That that was a, a it was the comfortable euphemism they were able to apply. Yes. Uh, but it, the North did not have a rallying cause because it took a long time to get to that. Uh, and Le uh, Meade's "We have driven the invaders from our soil" is the perfect demonstration of that. That's true. Uh, abolition was, was not a what is a big thing. Preserve the Union. Yeah. If you could preserve the Union by freeing the slaves, he would. If he could preserve the Union by by keeping them enslaved, he would have. The At Union point, was the cause. Right. That was At not first, understood until after Gettysburg. Right. Uh, well, I think Lincoln had already, because of the Emancipation Proclamation, he had already come to the understanding. I don't. Yeah. At the beginnings I mean, of an understanding. The rest of the army and the the, the, whole, the rest of the country. Oh, oh absolutely, yeah. Because uh, abolition was a uh, was still controversial. Uh, I'm not sure everybody wanted to go to war for that, but once they started to secede, uh, everybody was on board. In many respects, it's kind of a shell game here. Uh, and 150 years later. It looks different to us because we recognize the absolute vileness of the institution of slavery, but at the time that was not that. Unfortunately, it was that not was universal. Not, no. no, that was not the rallying cry that brought both sides to the table. That brought some of both sides to the table, but not all. And uh, that's kind of why uh, the lost cause was very good at uh, attempting to co-opt the idea of uh, it wasn't about slavery; it was about state rights. I'm sorry, that's that. We recognize well, in, today that was a smokescreen. Well, in some ways, you can make some the argument believe it. That, yes. that it was about states' rights from uh, from the North side because the, the South said, we as states have the right to secede. We are independent nations who gather together into the Union. That's right. the whole point of it being a Union. Whereas Lincoln said, well, no, you're, you, know, you have the wrong interpretation of those states' rights. Why they, you know, yes, slavery is the, the primary cause, but when you look at it from the North side, Slavery was not the issue that they went to war on. Uh, they went to war on preserving the Union. started out that way. I think it changed. Well, yeah, I really, I said, went I, yeah by the time yeah. 1864 comes around, and yeah, the Emancipation then, Proclamation was very instrumental in making it. it is, and, I, and I think we need to give Lincoln both a little bit of credit and a little bit of criticism. Lincoln was not a... Uh, uh, military strategist by any means, and he would have admitted this himself. Uh, in fact, there's a moment in the uh, recent Grant miniseries where Grant meets Lincoln for the first time, and Lincoln is kind of laying out all this strategy he's got for how Grant can do his job, and Grant kind of looks at him doesn't say anything, and Lincoln says, I recognize, sir, that you are the military genius. I'm not, uh, which is true. Uh, but strategically and socially, Lincoln is the one that first articulates and changes the attitudes of many people in both the North and affects those in the South that, no, this really is about safe slavery. It has to be about slavery. Lincoln himself didn't that understand universal. that at first. No, no. I don't know that, that that's as universal. Oh, no, as not at all. It it, it, today because it's complicated. See, there's Trevor Slattery well, yes, again. It's complicated. Yeah. But, I mean, when you think about the attitudes that uh, existed in the North post-war, they were just as as racist in the North, even the abolitionists. There were very few abolitionists that wanted to sit down to dinner with the freed slaves. You know, well, in yeah, many you ways, can see this is a virtue Roosevelt. signaling kind of thing. Yeah, you can see this. Moment. Yeah, uh, in many respects, you can see this in Teddy Roosevelt's uh, invitation to Booker T. Washington uh, to the White House. It garnered an enormous amount of criticism, not just in the South. Right. Uh, racism yeah. was still very much with us uh, in the early in the early 1900s in many respects, and, and I am the last person to give credit to Lyndon B. Johnson. I think he himself was a vile racist, but yes, he he's was. the one that presided over the change that I don't think he himself quite understood that moved, at least within law, to quote Ken Burns, at least within law, things changed. And it's taken us 50, 60 years to finally change hearts along with well, that. Well, I think the law comes first. In, in Correct. It has to be that way. As, I mean, the hearts that change the law come first, but the law changes everybody else. Oh, you are so good, sir. <laughs> You're exactly right. Man, we ought to write that one down. That is exactly right. There are hearts which, which change law, but laws which change hearts. And uh, that's ultimately kind of where hearts. we're... The rest of the heart, yeah. Uh, and that's exactly what we're talking about here. Uh, We've gone kind of far afield about the whole Jackson business, but 
uh, I, I, let, let's, let's, let me shift gears a little bit here. Just yeah, we because need to wrap it up, too. We, yeah, we, we need to play this. We knew we were going to go along with this, listeners. We hope you've stayed with us, of course. It's, it's, just, it's a fun thing where we can kind of take the real what if here. But my question is, okay, so what? To use your words, Robert, if the, the, assuming the battle never happens as we expected it to, and it happens in a way that is Jackson-oriented, what changes in the long term? I submit not well, much. How long a term? How long a term? Because Martin, you I say submit, zero? Well, yeah, I know Martin is going to say zero, and, and ultimately I would agree with that, but yeah. how we get to zero meaning a unified nation without slavery, yeah. uh, I think is very different because I think the war goes on longer. Um, You're right. I think, that's, I think, I think that's what we're talking about here. Yeah. And this is assuming Jackson doesn't – if Jackson lives, Jackson lives through the war. That's kind of a premise. Let me, let me lay that out here. We're well, not just saying he just doesn't die when he dies. He doesn't die later either. Well, uh, I think it goes longer for this reason. Okay. Because I presume that if – again, this is my – presumption, and I admit that this is total pulling it right out my rear end. That's okay. If Jackson lives, I think the invasion of the North goes far better. Sure. Uh, for the North, for the South than it does for the, uh, in, in reality. Uh, it has the potential to actually drive Lincoln from the Capitol, in my opinion, because Maybe. I don't know that the Army of the Potomac, if it's defeated again in this invasion, unless it's a, a, another battle of attrition like at Antietam or at Gettysburg, then Lee is going to have free reign to march on Washington. Now, if that happens, yeah. then it's possible that even if Lincoln escapes Washington, I don't know that he wins in 1864. If he does not win in 1864, the war does not end the way it ends. Whoa, the yeah. That's, that's, exactly. that's a big difference. That's a See, big difference, there. Sam. I think it's a long shot that Lee could march on Washington. Agreed. I, you, you, you'd have I to, think that's I mean, it. You'd have to completely annihilate the Army of the Potomac to put Lee in that kind of a position. I don't think that's possible. I really yeah. don't. And, and so, well, I don't you know, think you have to kill or maim every one of the 90,000, but, it, you know, it, it, if they're in no be, shape, pardon yeah. They'd have to be completely fractured as a fighting force. Sure, yeah. Well, even so, so what if he wash, marches on Washington? Lincoln evacuates and sets up uh, a capital elsewhere, and basically thumbs his nose at whoever's uh, the occupying force until he can raise enough men, because that will galvanize people. You want to talk about a recruiting thing? Yeah. Uh, and, and he's still going to call for Grant. That's exactly he, right. That's right. Because and, Vicksburg still happens. Um, well, if, if Vicksburg, yes, it does still happen. Grant, if assuming that this is the way it happens and Lee manages to march on Washington, yeah, I think uh, that's a good that's a good what if. Yeah, and, well, I think that's the ultimate uh, where you have to go with the, if Jackson lived, because otherwise there's no point in even asking the question because the presumption is that it's a profound difference on the battles of 1863, and the only no. profound difference is that they win the invasion. Otherwise, you really are, yeah. as Martin said, a zero difference. Well, that's right, so, because the only win, and the only win, is Washington gets occupied. If Washington and, gets occupied, then that's a totally different war for Grant to fight. Um, it is. You know, you also have the potential of freeing Maryland to join the Confederacy if Washington is occupied. I, I think that ship has sailed. I don't know that possibly, that's possible. Possibly. I'm just saying these are the things that are now thrown open. Because but it, the, hey, oh, all right, answer me this, boy. Uh, if so, if he goes somewhere, if Lincoln has to move somewhere else, he goes to what? Philadelphia, possibly. Uh, possibly, but that's going to be still kind of close. All um, right, you, know, you might I have to go to New York. That, maybe, but I don't. I don't know if he'll move that far away. Uh, in any case, well, it really no. doesn't matter. The, Lincoln's going to have uh, have the government elsewhere if he has to. Even if he's yeah, captured, yeah. somebody else will, will take over for him, and he'll be a captured war prisoner of war, etc. Uh, yeah, they me won't sue for I'm peace. With that yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking. Is is we won't sue for peace. That's what well, Lee was well, I, expecting. I, I, and I, don't I don't know. Think it's happen. In the immediate aftermath, maybe not. If, if Lincoln is captured, that throws everything to hell. If he gets away, you have 
the only president, or well, the second president, because uh, Madison uh, vacated Washington as well. Uh, but you know, you have uh, a president who vacates Washington. It's yeah. occupied, but not burned to the ground because you know that's probably that's probably they wouldn't probably, do that. They wouldn't they wouldn't do they're that. not going to do that. But this also takes and not just the pressure off of uh, Virginia for a few months, but for the rest of 1863. Yeah, sure, I would so, agree with that. So uh, I still think it's going to come out to year so what? Of, it's delay. Let me finish. You, so you've got an entire year for the entirety of the South. And, and I mean, when I say the South, I mean the Old South, all right? You know, you're right. talking about the eastern part of the South. To be war-free, I think that is a huge difference in their ability to fight, all right? And okay. ultimately the political capital that is in the, the propaganda coup of taking the American, uh, the United States capital as opposed to the Confederate States capital uh, and forcing Grant to fight from Pennsylvania okay. uh, as opposed to Northern Virginia because when he comes, they're still all in Virginia. Right. Um, so that's an awful lot of ground you have to retake. I think that could be enough for Beauregard, Beauregard I mean uh, McClellan, and Little Mac uh, to possibly defeat Lincoln. That's interesting. It's me, I'm yeah. thinking the political yeah. ramifications. That's where it has to be. That's yeah. where right. if this is yeah. I'm not talking a military victory outright. I'm yeah. talking a a, uh, a a political conceding because Little Mac wanted to get out of the war. Yeah, and that see that's something we as after the fact 150 years we forget a lot of that except for us historians like we are. Uh, that was McClellan's platform is we will stop this war, period, and we'll figure this out, whatever it's got to be. Uh, and that basically we means to let the going South go. Yeah, exactly. We would we were willing to let the South go. The we have two countries again, uh, as the alternate histories would probably tell us. That's not something that's probably sustainable in peace for very long. Uh, mm -hmm. And and we've got an episode coming up eventually that uh, that Robert's going to captain that talks a little bit about some of the stuff that's been uh, written about that because it's really a fascinating option. Nevertheless, uh, if Lincoln, the only way this ends differently for the Union is if Lincoln is defeated in '64. Exactly. And I think Jackson living and having a totally successful 1863, because I don't see the string of victories in 1863 ending all year. Uh, you know, I, I think that even if they don't take Washington, yeah. uh, I, think the, the, I think the Army of the Potomac is thrown in such a disarray that it's, it's going to take Grant longer to get on his feet. Yeah, because uh, if, if Gettysburg goes down as a, con as a rousing Confederate victory... Or whatever takes the place of Gettysburg. Yeah, well, exactly, whatever that is. Uh, that's kinda, there's only one more battle left, probably, in the Eastern Theater at this point. Uh, Grant's victory in Vicksburg has meaning, and yes, he is appointed most likely, but he's working from a very different position. The war ends much later... Only if Lincoln is reelected, and his reelection is very much in—I don't want to say in doubt, but in jeopardy. If he loses the capital, or if that, he loses all of 1863, yeah. seen as, as just too incompetent to continue. That's it, you, yeah. that, Martin. You have nailed it as you always do. You're exactly right. If Lincoln is seen as incompetent, he loses to McClellan, and then we have, and then the war is over. And uh, the Confederate states are allowed to exist on their own. No, and Sherman, Sherman doesn't get to go to Atlanta. No, everybody comes episode. Everybody comes home. What what a huge coup that is! That he can, you know, say Atlanta is ours and fairly won. Yeah. You know, he knows the propaganda of that in helping Lincoln win that fall. Now, on um, the other hand. Sherman is not sent off to Atlanta either. Maybe that right. makes a big enough That's difference. That's what I mean. That's so what I mean. That, yeah. He's know, got to stay with Grant to help him retake all this. Uh, right. And maybe land. that is enough to – because, you know, if you take Grant and Sherman, add that to whatever's left over of the Army of the Potomac, and you've got one hell of a fighting force that is going to dwarf the South like it hasn't been seen since yeah. uh, McClellan's uh, Peninsula campaign. Yeah. And probably you've got 200,000 men in Virginia. With right. the will to use it, unlike with the will to use it, so it yeah. may be that ultimately that overrides Jackson's 
uh, ability and and skill on the battlefield being there. It, it all depends on how how everybody ultimately what's left of the Army of Northern Virginia, how long it takes Grant to get back and to constitute a fighting force. Yeah. 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 Yep. That's you know, huge. So yeah, I think, that is huge. I think ultimately, yeah, Martin is right that we end up with one country, but it may take another generation or two. Uh, if the South is allowed to stand as a confederacy. Yeah, yeah I well, think you're exactly right on this, and this is here is, I suspect we've kind of segued into the whole reason that the South, the lost cause mentality, latched on to this to begin with, is if Jackson wins, Lincoln may lose 64, and everything changes. Because yeah. if Lincoln loses 64, it's over. There's two yeah. countries. Uh, and this has the, you know, in 62 we have the issue of, and we did this in one of our other episodes, of if France or England comes in on the side of the Confederacy, then we have two countries. If Lincoln loses the 64 election, we have two countries. Those are the two real linchpin moments. And so it comes down, it comes down to Grant's ability to come east and have victories somewhere in the Eastern Theater. Right. Which, now, he, which doesn't take place in... You know, it's yeah, important he, that we recognize if, this. Re, even, Vicksburg doesn't do that. Chattanooga does that. He hasn't actually earned that right yet. He has to... Well, yeah. it's, Ch Chattanooga takes, takes... really is what takes that on. And Chattanooga doesn't happen if Chickamauga doesn't happen, and Chickamauga doesn't happen if the guys from the East, Longstreet in particular, doesn't go there. Mm -hmm. So well, there's there it, really is a connection between the east and west yeah. here there is. that is a little that yeah. that, uh, it, it, that could prevent Grant from even being brought back. Yeah, it, if if Jackson and Lee and Longstreet are having success in Pennsylvania, whatever takes the place of the Gettysburg battle, the Pennsylvania campaign continues. Grant comes east; he has to bring Sherman. They can't split up. And again, they have to concentrate. 200,000 men somewhere in the east and try to drive Lee back to Virginia. There has to be success there to guarantee Lincoln's re-election in 64. Right. In and the respect, question is, that's right. can that happen in time? Moving in that time. many men... Yeah. Because you got to remember, in the real world, you know, Grant does not exactly. come east and have successes until 1864. Yeah. Right. And that's on top of Meade's success. You know, he's got a yeah. good starting point. That's right. I mean, a negative starting point. I just, I don't know. I think if if they win in '63 in the South, or the South wins in '63 in whatever that battle takes, I think that throws everything into jeopardy. You're right. I think that the, there's no way that Lincoln enjoys the absolute support that he has because ultimately he has enormous. I mean, it's a land, it's one of those landslide victories in '64. That doesn't happen. Maybe he maybe he might squeak by. But I don't think so. A lot of the, the a lot of the uh, uh, the army votes is what puts Lincoln over the fact. Yeah. Lincoln, actually, McClellan had the audacity to think he actually had a chance. But well, but in the before, mix. the army was doing pretty well. Exactly. Lincoln. It's very different at this point. Lincoln has shown his competence in appointing the right commander, and Grant has the the will of the people because he's had this enormous victory in Vicksburg and Chattanooga after that. That. Everybody's got a confidence in the administration at that point. Well, Gettysburg, uh, or the lack thereof, may put that in jeopardy. Okay. Well, we're, we're hitting on 90 minutes here, but one other quick point, and then yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll wrap us up here. But we'll wrap us up, yeah. Yeah, keep in mind, too, that, yes, Meade, Meade Hancock, Reynolds, Buford, have, they've delivered a victory at Gettysburg. Yeah. But... Meade is still not really in favor because he doesn't follow up. Right. Lincoln and that's is why furious. Grant is giving command. Yeah. Lincoln is furious because there's no follow-up. And you're yeah. exactly right, Robert. That's that's really the drive then where the decision's made. Okay, I'm I'm going to put Grant now in charge of everything. He delivers victories with no compromise, unlike Meade. So, guys, that was yeah. a great episode. Uh I knew this was going to be good. This <laughs> is the one go I've been waiting for. 
Surprisingly, we didn't go into the movie all all that much because that's – as Robert has said many times, our love of the Civil War started in 1992 with that movie by Ron Maxwell that uh, all of a sudden made all this make sense to us. Yeah. And we let both we all three of us latched onto that, and I, I'll give a little plug for it. You can certainly find it. You should watch it because it makes something uh, something that's almost so large you can't understand it as bur- brilliantly understandable. Thank you yeah. to Michael Shara and to Ron Maxwell for making that all of a sudden American history is accessible by all of us. Yeah. But a lot of that great movie. performances. A lot of great oh, performances in goodness, that film. Yes. So, uh, Richard Jordan is. Oh yeah, may he rest in peace. It was yeah, his last his role. last film, and he was so moving as as Louis Armistead. Uh, Jeff Daniels, of course, is incredible as Chamberlain. A lot of great oh, performances. Oh well, absolutely. Well, you can. Uh, you, Stephen Lang is Pickett. My goodness. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah it, it was fantastic, uh, and, and he even did a, a, just as good a job. Surprisingly, I was a little worried when they first announced his casting, but he did a fantastic job as Stonewall Jackson in Gods and Generals. After the fact, uh, there's a lot of great. Th- I'll, I'll give a. I'll raise my glass, gentlemen, to Ted Turner for making all that happen because he's the financier. That's the only thing I'll happen. raise my glass to Ted Turner for. That's yeah. correct because we you know, we don't really you know like Ted for lots of things, but daggone, he makes a great Civil War movie. They did it twice. I just yeah. wish he had adapted, and I understand money-wise it's hard to make it happen, but I wish he'd adapted uh, Je- uh, Jeff Shara's book, The Last Full Measure, which would have brought Grant, been the story of Ulysses S. Grant, and taken us to the end of the war. Yeah. I will give a quick plug to uh, Leonardo DiCaprio, actually, who was the executive producer of the recent History Channel Grant miniseries. If you have the ability to see that, it is really a very good portrayal. It lays it out very honestly. Uh, it does not shy away from Grant's criticisms, but as a general rule, it lays him out as the real marble man that I think he should be seen yeah. as. In many respects, he and Lincoln deserve a lot of credit that uh, they, should, they, sh- they should be put up there as people worthy of, of our, our, our admiration. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Francis, what's next, buddy? Oh, we're going code of honor next time. Uh, as as you might know, that we've kind of if you figure if you what, if you listen to us every week, you've kind of figured out the way that our format works here. We do a history channel, his, excuse me, history episode, and then we'll do the code of honor. Then we'll do a hero, and then we'll do pop culture. Next time is code of honor, so we're gonna circle back around to some really great quotations from who knows where. I've got mine already in my mind. Uh, I don't know about the other two guys. Well, Martin's already got his figured out. I Robert, have no until I hear yours. <laughs> that's right. Robert is our, is our hammer on this. He doesn't pick his. He's got a, now, he's got a long list of options here. So, uh, he doesn't usually completely freeform that. But he'll, no, take what, he'll take what Martin and I kind of lay out and say, I got one that goes with that. And he brings it on home. So join us next episode. As always, you're going to love it. Thanks for being with us here every week at Snakes and Otters, a pointless discussion of eternal questions. Be sure to spread the word on your social media accounts. Follow us and retweet us. We are on Instagram and on Twitter at Snakes and Otters. Let your friends know that they can find us on Podbean, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Apple Podcasts, and on YouTube. Just search Snakes and Otters Podcast to find us. And please, remember to leave us your comments and reviews. It helps people find us. And you can always send us an email at snakesandotterspodcast at gmail.com. I'm Martin. I'm Robert. And I'm Francis. Catch us next week. Same snake time, same otter channel.